So um, as Joan said, I started my own business hand harvesting edible seaweeds in 2003. And I've been teaching um, about seaweeds for over 15 years now and just finished uh, writing my first book about seaweeds and I'll have a, a kid's book coming out next year. And I'm really thrilled to be um, speaking with you tonight about my favorite topic, seaweeds. So I've put some slides together and um, I'm gonna be talking about just a brief introduction of what seaweeds are and then um, sort of drawing some parallels between seaweeds role in ecological health of the earth and the oceans and how that sort of parallels to um, helping support human health. And then we'll get into some of our, our local edible species and just have a look at some of those and finish up with a couple of seaweeds that are really great for something called thalassotherapy, which is um, using skin, using seaweeds um, to reap the benefits through skin absorption. So we'll go ahead and <clears throat> so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to seaweeds. Um, because they are not the easiest group of organisms to define. Um, so I will start by talking about algae. And algae is a very large and diverse group of organisms. And seaweeds belong to this larger group that we call algae. And algae is an incredibly diverse group of organisms. Um, the, that really the, the two main dividing points of life on earth is the cell type, whether it has prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells and algae encompasses both of that. So algae includes basically single celled, almost like a photosynthesizing bacteria type organism, all the way up to the large multicellular, also photosynthesizing, photosynthesizing organisms that we refer to as algae or as seaweeds. Um, but all algae are photosynthetic and they can live in almost every environment on earth. They can live in deep sea vents. They can live in uh, the intertidal zone. They can live on the fur of polar bears and sloths and on the shells of turtles. Um, so they're just this incredibly diverse group of organisms and very, very ancient. It's thought that, um, that all life on earth evolved from a uh, microalgae type organism. So when we talk about seaweeds, we're talking about macroalgae. So multicellular um, marine algae. So algae that's living in the ocean that's multicellular. And seaweeds lack roots, they lack flowers, they lack seeds. They're much more ancient and simple than plants. And the seaweeds are further divided into three groups. We have the red seaweeds and the green seaweeds, which are placed in the plant kingdom. And then we have the brown seaweeds, which are in kingdom Chromista. So now we get to what is kelp. <laughs> so all kelp are brown seaweeds. Um, and the strict definition of what a kelp is, is a brown seaweed that's in the order laminarials. But the most useful definition is that they're the really big brown seaweeds. <laughs> so if you see a very large brown seaweed at the beach, you, you've got yourself a kelp, especially in this neck of the woods. We have 30 species of kelp in the Pacific Northwest, and that's the greatest diversity of kelp of anywhere on the planet. Um, they are, like I said, they're the largest seaweeds in the world. Uh, the two largest seaweeds on the planet are giant kelp and bull kelp, both of which grow here and form our beautiful um, kelp forests. And kelp require cold water to grow. And um, 
uh, the warming waters is, is quite a challenge for the kelp. So upward growing kelp, the kelp that grows up like this and have structures that, that enable them to grow up as opposed to ground cover, they form what we call the kelp forest ecosystems. And kelp forest ecosystems are incredibly important um, globally. They grow on about a quarter of the coastlines of the world. They absorb ab massive amounts of carbon dioxide. They're among the most productive ecosystems on the planet. They support an incredible amount of biodiversity and phycologists estimate that they're in a global state of decline right now at an estimated rate of about 2% per year. There are numerous factors um, involved in this global decline, but the top kelp phycologists um, point to an increased incidence of marine heat waves um, that's really the top driver of this global decline. Um, at fairly small increases in ocean temperature, uh, kelp can no longer reproduce. And if a marine heat wave is quite extreme, um, it can kill the kelp outright. And when the upward growing kelp die, they are often replaced with uh, seaweeds that grow and they don't form structure, they just do ground cover. Um, and so these are, we call turf ecosystems. And it's really that upward structure that really creates uh, uh, ecosystem that can support a lot of, of biodiversity. And without those upward growing kelp, the biodiversity decreases in those ecosystems. So I'm going to use the word algae here for the next uh, little bit, which remember includes all the seaweeds. Um, so algae provides an estimated 50 to 80% of global oxygen. It's incredibly nourishing for the earth. And this is really the microalgae that's um, providing most of the earth's oxygen. And they're also the primary producer of the largest ecosystem on the planet, the ocean. So everything in the ocean from the tiniest zooplankton all the way up to the mighty orca, everything in that ecosystem is dependent on the algae for the primary production. That's also incredibly nourishing to humans. So seaweeds are the most concentrated food source of minerals on the planet. Their most edible seaweeds are rich in vitamins A, B, C, D, E, and K. Um, Proteins are a great, or sorry, seaweeds are a great source of protein. Um, nori is the highest edible seaweed in protein. It can be up to about 50% protein. So um, really good source there. They're, they contain both soluble and non-soluble fiber. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of the specific fiber compounds that, that have a lot of potential to support human health. They're also a great source of essential fatty acids, usually in a ideal one-to-one -one ratio, which is optimal for human health. They also, seaweeds can have very rare types of essential fatty acids um, that are very supportive to human health. And they're also a source of prebiotics. So they actually, the prebiotics actually nourish your gut, um, fauna. So, and we know that the, the, what happens in the gut, that's most of where our immunity resides. It's affected for overall health, neurological health. So seaweeds can actually feed the gut uh, fauna. Seaweed also, algae seaweed is an amazing protector of the earth. Um, Algae absorbs an estimated one third of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And also there's some species of microalgae are critical to cloud formation. 
Some species of microalgae, when they die, they release dimethyl sulfide, and that reacts with aerosol sulfites to create the nuclei of clouds, um, which is a really critical process um, to helping to regulate climate. And seaweeds, in particular, the macroalgae or the seaweeds help lower acidity of the water. And shellfish farmers have been growing their shellfish with seaweed for years to um, help offset you know, acidification in their shellfish and also to help clean the water and keep the, the water a lot more clean on their farms. Seaweeds also help to transform toxins in the ocean. Um, in particular, certain heavy metals in the same way that they're dangerous to humans and harmful to human health, they can be harmful to the health of the seaweed. So if, if, they're, if the seaweed absorbs this harmful form of the heavy metal, which is usually an inorganic form that's really detrimental to health, they will store it in an organic molecule, which essentially is not biologically reactive so that it causes less harm. Um, so very cleansing to the ocean as well. And there's a number of um, bioremediation projects using seaweeds to clean polluted waterways. Seaweeds also are amazing uh, protectors in our bodies. Sodium alginate is this phenomenal compound. It's found in the brown seaweeds and it binds to certain toxins, some of the worst toxins known um, certain heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, certain radioactive isotopes, um, and it forms an insoluble salt, so it's not going to be released into the bloodstream, uh, and it's safely excreted through the stool. Another really incredible compound is fucoidin, which is um, a fiber. And fucoidin is also found in brown seaweeds. It's located in the cell wall of brown seaweeds. And it's hypothesized that its role in the seaweed is to help uh, protect it from desiccation. So when the seaweed is getting completely dried out at the low tide, um, the fucoidin helps protect it and prevent protein misfolding and other things like that that can happen when the seaweed's dried out. Fucoidin has been subject of well over a thousand um, published peer-reviewed science articles. Uh, it's shown several anti-cancer mechanisms um, and in studies with many different kinds of cancers. And most of these studies are either on human cancer lines in vitro or on live animals in vivo. There hasn't been a, a lot of um, like clinical studies on whole human beings. So hopefully that's um, you know, gonna be happening more and more, but just showing an amazing range for supporting human health, enhancing immune function, cancer prevention, um, cardiovascular disease prevention, type two diabetes, just really showing a lot of phenomenal potential. Um, some similar findings have been uh, found with fucoxanthin, which has also been the subject of many uh, peer-reviewed science studies. Um, fucoxanthin is also in the brown seaweeds, and it's involved in light harvesting for photosynthesis. And it's similar with fucoidin, it's shown uh, several anti-cancer um, mechanisms in mostly again in in vivo and in vitro studies, uh, as well as a range of other effects like immune enhancing, uh, anti-pathogenic activity, anti-inflammatory activity. Seaweeds are incredibly resilient. They have been on this earth for a very long time, around 1.5 billion years, and they grow in very extreme environments. So most seaweeds grow in the intertidal zone, 
And depending where in the world that is, they can be in a 24 hour period, they can be subjected to freezing and thawing, completely drying out, being covered up, wild variations in temperature. They can be exposed to pathogens, both airborne and marine. Um, so they're just incredibly resilient. And they not only just survive these extreme conditions, but you know, if you, most rocky shores that aren't affected by you know, man-made things such as pollution, you will see that they absolutely thrive there. And because they've had to adapt to these really extreme living conditions, they've developed just this whole medley of, of unique compounds that are biologically active and have a real potential to support human health. One of the main um, things that seaweeds need to be able to do when living in these extreme environments is to prevent their proteins from um, being denatured or misfolding. And fucoidin um, that I was mentioning before, there's studies on fucoidin um, and showing um, in vitro activity for preventing certain pro protein misfoldings which are called amyloids associated with certain neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so some really exciting results there. And the, the seaweed that they're studying um, in this, for this, this study that's looking at the prevention of amyloids and um, neurodegenerative diseases is actually a seaweed that grows in the Bay of Fundy, which is, has the most extreme tides in the world. So this seaweed, it's called Alaria esculenta. It's been really effective at protecting itself from you know, these really wild variations. So really exciting stuff. Um, they also can protect against, they have so many different um, antibacterial compounds, antiviral compounds, antifungal compounds. And these are, are different from seaweed to seaweed. And they just have this really broad range of protection from these pathogens, because again, they're exposed to both marine pathogens and airborne pathogens. So we'll get into a bit of the fun part and talk about some of our local edible seaweeds. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have the greatest cold water seaweed diversity on the planet. So that's estimated that there's about 650 species. So we have many species of edible seaweeds and probably lots that are edible that just don't have a, a culture or a, a tradition of being used as a food. Uh, but it's just a wonderful place to live if you're interested in seaweed because the diversity is quite phenomenal. And with this, um, amazing diversity and these huge healthy areas of intertidal seaweeds and kelp forests, of course, comes um, an equal amount of responsibility to make sure that any harvesting is done ethically and sustainably. Seaweeds are among the fastest growing organisms on the planet. Uh, bull kelp, for example, is the second largest seaweed in the world, and it is an annual species. It can grow over 30 meters long in about six months time. Uh, it's incredibly fast growing. So if seaweeds are cut in the right place, they will continue growing much like, just like pruning. Uh, if they are cut in the wrong place, then they will not regenerate. So. Having education, if you're going to be harvesting your own, is really essential. Um, there are some sort of rules across the board with pruning, but really knowing the species you want to harvest will affect sort of where you want to cut it and how much you want to leave. Um, so having some education about that, making sure there's lots and lots of the species you want to harvest. Um, knowing the life cycle of the seaweed that you're interested in harvesting is really important as well. As I mentioned, seaweeds span two different kingdoms. So 
they have many, many different ways that they reproduce. Some reproduce asexually, some reproduce sexually. Um, so a lot of seaweeds will have separate reproductive structures that should be left alone. Many seaweeds do not have any separate reproductive structures. So just having, again, some education about the species if you're interested in harvesting your own. Um, of course, especially as a commercial harvester, um, having permission from the local First Nations, if you're planning to harvest on a traditional territory of a First Nation. And um, when you're taking something from an ecosystem, it's always feels like a, um, you know, keeping things in balance to uh, be able to give something back. So sort of making a plan to give something back as well. So we'll talk about some edible brown seaweeds to start off with. And I mentioned some of these compounds, but I'll just, as a reminder, um, the fucoidin and the fucoxanthin that I said um, show a lot of potential and activity for disease prevention, cancer prevention, um, immune enhancement, and also the sodium alginate, which helps to safely cleanse toxins from the body. Um, these are all unique to the brown seaweeds. Um, the red seaweeds and green seaweeds also have their own unique um, healing properties and unique nutritional compounds. So you can kind of think of the three different groups of seaweeds like you would vegetables, you know, there's um, red vegetables and green vegetables and the purple ve vegetables, they sort of have different nutritional makeup and, and healing compounds within them. So seaweeds are similar like that. Bulk health, like I mentioned, is the second largest seaweed on the planet. The largest seaweed is giant kelp, um, but giant kelp is a perennial. So bulk kelp is achieving this phenomenal size in a single growing season. Uh, to harvest bull kelp, bull kelp is a subtitle species. So uh, it's one of the species I harvest commercially and I harvest by snorkeling. So I snorkel out in the kelp forest um, and then I'll harvest half of the blades. You can see in the picture on the right hand side, um, the bottom half or the part that's sort of attached to the bottom and that grows up like this long hollow tube culminating in that bulb, that part of the seaweed is called the stipe. And if, if the stipe is cut, and this is true of any seaweed, if the stipe is cut, then the seaweed won't regenerate. So the new growth of kelp happens in the first, um, the area of the blade that's attached to the stipe. That's called the intercalary zone. That's where all the new growth happens. So you want to leave a good portion of the blade attached to the stipe and then you would cut above that. And I leave about half the blades completely intact on any individual bull kelp. The other thing to keep in mind um, with bull kelp, both harvesting it and eating it, is that bull kelp reproduces by growing spore patches on some of the blades. And these appear, you'll see them in the center of a blade, they'll look like thicker, darker, rectangular shaped patches. And those contain millions and millions of spores and they'll get progressively thicker and darker. And the oldest spore patches will be at the distal end of the blade and the newest ones will be close to the site. And they will actually drop out. The cells around the spore patch will um, die and allow the patch to drop out and that patch will settle, hopefully close to the bottom, but if it doesn't make it all the way, um, the spores actually have little flagella that enable them to be mobile and get the rest of the way down, which is the only seaweed that's known to reproduce that way. Um, and it's because the, the blades of the bull kelp sit right at the surface. So the, those spores have to get all the way down to the bottom, whereas most other kelp 
they have the reproductive structure very close to the bottom to try and sort of solve that problem. So kelp or bull kelp is really interesting. Um, in addition to wanting to leave the spore patches intact so that the bull kelp can reproduce, they also taste very different. So if you get a really mature spore patch, it's generally people do not like the flavor of it. So. Next, we have winged kelp. So the two species that I commercially harvest for my business are the bull kelp and the winged kelp. Winged kelp I harvest uh, very differently than the bull kelp. So this is a low intertidal species. So I'm just walking around in about waist deep water. Um, the winged kelp has separate reproductive structures close to the bottom that grow laterally off the stipe. So again, leaving the stipe intact, leaving the reproductive structures intact, and then leaving a good portion of the blade, a good foot or two of the blade, and then cutting. Um, winged kelp is related to the Japanese wakame, and um, it's a, quite a beloved culinary seaweed. It's used, it's the traditional seaweed used to flavor miso soup broth. It's an absolutely wonderful. Um, flavor, texture of seaweed. It kind of takes on the consistency of like a flat noodle when it's reconstituted in soups. It's also rich in mannitol, which is a, um, it's a type of sugar, but it doesn't affect the body uh, the way that glucose would. So it gives it this sweet flavor, but it's very safe for um, people that are sensitive, like with diabetes or sensitive to sugars. So it's quite a, a lovely edible seaweed. Feather boa, always a, <laughs> a good crowd pleaser at the beach, fun seaweed. Um, you won't find feather boa uh, available in stores, but it certainly is edible. It's also a kelp. Um, and the you can see from the picture on the right, the midrib is quite thick and leathery, so it's not really that palatable. It could be used to flavor a uh, soup broth or something like that, but generally it's those tender fronds that grow off the side that are um, the really nice culinary part of the seaweed. So you can just go ahead and just leave the seaweed totally intact and just trim some of the fronds along the side and just leave the rest of the seaweed floating. Um, it also has little floats, you can kind of see uh, one in the close-up picture there on the left-hand side. Um, and those floats, um, the, the feather boa and the winged kelp grow both in the same area of the tidal zone in the low intertidal. So the winged kelp doesn't float at all, it just has a ground cover. And those floats allow the feather boa to form this really shallow water canopy above the winged kelp. So quite a, a really neat little ecosystem. So now we'll talk about some of the edible red seaweeds. Pacific dulse is one of my absolute favorite snacking seaweeds. So whereas the winged kelp I'll, I'll use in soups or um, in stir fries or use it to wrap fish to, to cook. And the bull kelp I use more like a seasoning ground up and, and um, used as a savory umami seasoning on things. Uh, dulse is a really great snacking seaweed to just eat uh, straight out of the bag. It's um, so again, the, the dulse that you'll find in the store is coming from the East Coast, um, most likely Maine, Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick, or PEI. And that species is Palmaria palmata, and the dulse that we have is Palmaria mollus. So if you are a dulse connoisseur, you can definitely tell the difference. They're a little bit different in flavor and texture, but quite similar. And they're very rich in iron and have a very meaty type of flavor to them and are very chewy. So they have a really great texture for being a snack food. 
And there is a long tradition of harvesting dulse on the, in the Maritimes in the east coast of Canada. And traditional health uses for the dulse was, one of them was to build the blood. So people with um, they, what they would call weak constitutions um, or probably anemia based um, things would eat the dulse to get more iron and, and minerals into their blood and, and help build their constitution. It was also used as a vermifuge to rid the body of intestinal worms. And there's claims that it helped to alleviate seasickness as well. So black nori, um, this is one of the red seaweeds that didn't necessarily get the memo that it's a red seaweed. <laughs> so uh, it is in fact a red seaweed, but it doesn't look very pink or purplish um, like most of the other red seaweeds. Although when it's dried, it definitely has a, a bit of a plum sort of hue to it. Um, black nori is absolutely delicious, wonderful culinary seaweed. Uh, it's very labor intensive to process. It's not very hard to harvest, um, but takes a long time to process. So the, it grows in the high intertidal zone and it has an almost tiny little discernible hold fast. So the hold fast is the part of the seaweed that grips onto the rock. Um, so you have to be very careful harvesting the nori because it's very easy to pull up by accident. So you wanna be very gentle with it. It also, it's only one cell thick and it gives it this really like a stretchy cellophane like texture, which also can make it tricky to make sure it stays attached to the rock. So I will often harvest this one with scissors because with the knife, it just keeps stretching. So with scissors, it's easier to leave it attached to the rock. Um, because it's a high intertidal and it's very frilly, it's very susceptible to, um, first of all, if it's high intertidal, it could just have sand and dirt and things like that because it's not actually floating in the water. It also can have um, univalves and isopods and even shore crabs living inside it. So it has to be really meticulously rinsed. And ideally you wanna do that in clean seawater. Uh, and then to spread it to dry takes an enormous amount of time and space. So you wanna make sure you're spreading it out so it can dry flat, um, but plenty worth the, the effort as it's just a wonderful, wonderful tasting seaweed. And an edible green seaweed, we have um, the sea lettuce. And sea lettuce can be uh, two different genera. So we have alva and we have alvaria. We used to have many different species, uh, local species named of alva. And that's been really shrunken down with a lot of the genetic testing as we've realized that, that Alva has an amazing um, diversity of morphologies that fall within just a handful of species really. Um, and both, both are, are edible, but there's a distinct difference between the genus Alva and the genus Alvaria in terms of their co composition. The Alvaria can have up to about 30% by dry weight of dopamine, <laughs> whereas the alva does not have dopamine. So you can eat your alvaria and get a rush of motivation and pleasure. Um, it's very hard to tell which genus you're looking at. Um, even expert phycologists, when the seaweed is actually growing and it's habitat, it's very hard to tell the difference. It's easier once it's been dried or of course looking at it under a microscope. But a lovely edible seaweed, it is two cells thick, which is just enough of a difference to give it a different texture where it doesn't have that stretch. It's just more brittle. But again, it, it dries very, very quickly. Um, it's also like the nori, it's very susceptible to the univalves and crabs and um, isopods, so it also needs to be very well rinsed. Okay. 
So another way to get some of the amazing health benefits of seaweed is something that people have been doing for thousands of years called thalassotherapy or um, bathing with seaweeds. And even us, for people that have compromised digestion, digestion issues or things like that, um, the lasso therapy can sometimes even be more effective than eating it for certain things. Um, but it's been used for um, many, many generations to help um, induce a feeling of calm, to uh, keep a, a vital constitution, a youthful constitution. Um, it encourages toxin cleansing uh, through the skin. It has analgesic qualities to it, um, and it's very nourishing and toning for the skin. So one of the most beautiful seaweeds is an amazing seaweed for thalassotherapy called rainbow seaweed or Mazaella splendens. If you see it in the water on a sunny day, um, it can flash all the different colors of the rainbow like jewels. And I've had many people when I've been giving seaweed tours say, oh my gosh, I always thought that there was oil in the water when I saw that. <laughs> so um, it's just a, a pretty spectacular seaweed. And the, the rainbow seaweed is very effective for skin conditions, for chronic skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema, rosacea. Um, it's really effective. It has powerful antiviral and antifungal properties. So for um, skin infections, fungal infections, um, and that's just, you know, laying it right on, on the affected area in the bath. If you can't, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of baths or things like that, you can soak the seaweed, put it on the affected area, wrap a tensor bandage around to keep it on for a good amount of time. And that's another way to um, help with skin conditions using the rainbow seaweed. And some of the favorites for um, using like a natural loofah um, is the Turkish towel, the chondrocanthus species, and the Turkish washcloth, the mastocarpus species. We have a couple of uh, representative species in both those genera here. And they're covered with these bumps called papillae, which makes them a perfect natural exfoliant or a natural scrubby. So you can take those in the bath and um, rub them on dry areas, use them as a natural exfoliant, um, and then if you hang them up in between baths, um, then you can use them five or six times sometimes. The, this, these two genres are really good at holding sort of their, their vitality for several uses. They're also incredibly rich in carrageenan, which is really nourishing to the skin, helps improve tone. Um, and you can feel that the carrageenan feels like this gelatinous, um, almost cream that you can rub on. So when the seaweed is exposed to the fresh water, because it's used to being in the salt water, when it's exposed to that fresh water, the cell membranes burst and it just really releases this um, intracellular fluid. And you can go ahead and sort of rub that all over your skin and it's quite lovely. And the rockweed, um, very common seaweed that most people from the Pacific Northwest will probably recognize. It has those bladders that everyone says you can pop. <laughs> um, and those bladders that you can pop are actually the reproductive part of this seaweed. So those actually contain eggs and sperm. Um, and then contained in there, this you'll feel if you break that open, it's this gelatinous sort of aloe vera like um, liquid inside. And that's the sodium alginate. That's the, the um, compound that helps to cleanse toxins from the body. That's really rich in the sodium alginate. It's that gelatinous sort of component. 
And also very rich contained in those tips is fucoidin as well. So um, again, using the rockweed in the bath, um, incredibly, you can feel the difference in your skin. It's incredibly soft, but it's also um, imparting the, um, the benefits that you get from the fucoidin and from the toxin cleansing of the sodium alginate. Um, it can help with, if you have burns, either sunburn or burns from the oven or the wood stove, it's very anti-infection and healing to the skin. Um, and the liquid inside is actually has some um, SPF component to it. And that is because if the eggs and sperm are exposed to UV, the UV will kill them. So this gelatinous component has developed UV resistance in order to protect the gametes from that damage from the sun. So I want to turn it over now. Um, um, I hope you've all been writing some questions in the chat. And if not, um, I think Joan is going to field some questions. And um, uh, so anything that you want to know about seaweed, then if I can answer, I will. And if I can't, I will be researching it later <laughs> tonight or tomorrow because I'm the one of the things I love the most about seaweed is that I there's always something new to learn. So I hope that um, you feel inspired by seaweed, and I'd love to um, have some questions now if anyone has some. <laughs> 